Good evening and welcome to the regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. Uh, I guess we'll start and Madam Secretary will call the roll. Sure. Um, President Maltz is not here tonight. Vice President Wasserman. Here. And I'm here. Treasurer Ole. Here. Um, Member Branstad. Here. Member Gordon. Here. And Member Kaminsky. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum and as Lynn said, I am substituting for President Maltz tonight to lead the meeting. Um, the first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. And in your materials, you'll see the approval of the regular minute, meeting minutes of May 29th and the special meeting minutes last uh, June 4th with the contract approval. Uh, we have a list of staff members who have announced their resignation, the effective dates. Uh, there are several textbooks uh, that uh, are, out, are presented for the 28-day presentation period. Um, the Actually, Jerry, I think this is for adoption. Yeah. Ah, presented for the, yes, thank you, for adoption. Uh, bids uh, bids are out and were requested and sent to six vendors for multi-purpose uh, copy paper for middle and public schools. Five have responded, and we are requesting a purchase order approval to Unisource of Addison, Illinois. Bids are also requested and sent to three vendors for lawn mowers to replace five mowers that uh, range in age of 13 to 23 years. We're only replacing three of the five. Uh, we're requesting a purchase order to be uh, issued to Spartan Distributors in Spartan, Michigan, Michigan for two Toro 72-inch cut diesel mowers at a price of 24000 each and Midwest Golf and Turf in Novi, Michigan for a Jacobson 16-foot cut diesel mower at a price of 67000 That's a big mower. Yeah. <laughs> Staffing letters um, will be going out uh, from Mr. Ellinger to our staff this year and in the agenda are the listed tenures, about to be tenured, those on leave, etc. And the approvals also request authorized payment for the following legal bills to the Thune Law Firm of $2,045.49. I'll move approval of consent items 2.1 through 2.7. Support. Moved by Mr. Oley, support by Dr. Kaminsky. All in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. With that, we'll move on to requests to address the board. Betty, would you care to address us? <laughs> Talk to us, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I want to give you every opportunity, though, <laughs> to stand out from the crowd. Okay, we'll move on to Board of Education matters. Uh, we have an item for action tonight on the Central Middle School Auditorium HVAC control upgrade. And I'll hand it over to Mrs. Uh, Klein. Yes, <clears throat> and this... Uh, is another item that's been bid. It's for the HVAC controller. And we looked at uh, two different options here. The scope of work involves replacing the existing main controller with a web-based controller. Our original units are no longer supported with the present technology. Uh, and we do need to get this done before we begin classes this fall. There was a second option that was significantly more extensive and expensive. And in lieu, or in light of the fact that Central is scheduled to be closed as a middle school at the end of next year, we thought that this was the least expensive way to go. So we recommend issuing a purchase order to the low bidder, J.E. Johnson, for $9,470. Move approval. <coughs> move, move by Mr. Oley, and I think that came from Ms. Ransat. Okay. Um, any questions for Linda or comments? I have a question. Will the controller unit allow um, still those temperatures in uh, you know the climate control down at a lower level once the school is con uh, is closed? Uh, um, as I imagine in it's be critical zones of the building. Yes. Unfortunately, no. That that would be a, a much larger project. And keeping it dialed into a, like let's say a single oh, level yeah, would be better controlled. I would imagine if we're not going to be in the building as yeah. much. Uh, to bring some insurance that that uh, system will be running yes. as, it, uh, it as confident as possible. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so this does leave us operable for several years. Exactly. Above minimum temps. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the other unit was considerably more expensive. And for those in the audience, this unit's going to be $9,470 as in the agenda. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. We'll move on to item 4.2, salary adjustments for employee groups of 2012 and 13. And this says Mr. Ellinger, but I, I'll hand it to you and then let you hand it off to Mrs. Quinn. 
It's, uh, I think we're going to bring up a PowerPoint presentation and show you as I uh, review our annual salary letter uh, like we typically do at the first board meeting in June. Uh, we're going to review an outline uh, of a report for the 2012-13 wage provisions for the 14 employee groups of uh, Midland Public Schools um, this evening. Negotiations are complete with, complete with the Mid Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals and with the Midland City Education Association, which represent teachers and electronic learning facilitators. The contract with the Midland City Education Support Personnel Association, MOSESPA, which represents the grounds of maintenance employees, expires on September 30th of this coming fall. The wages on page four are in effect from July 1 through that date. Um, we're going to share with you a little bit in general what's uh, included in this. Um, these are the groups that I just mentioned to you. And then secondly, um, this salary letter really impacts all the non-affiliated, the non-unionized groups in the district, the administrative assistants and office professionals, all administrative employees, athletic event supervisor employees, auditorium and workstation techs, co-op students, work experience students, and student assistants if we have any. Management employees, all those with the title manager, of course. Substitute teachers, at least those not contracted through our third party, PESG. Substitute temporary secretaries, temporary seasonal employees, therapy assistants, and transportation employees. The recommendation for these unaffiliated employee groups in terms of their compensation would be to maintain their salary and wage scales at the 11-12 level. This continues concessions that were made in the previous years, which is the part of the r rationale for why we would uh, make this recommendation. And where permitted by law or required by board policy, pay all the merit-based or negotiated raises that move an employee uh, through and along their range scales that are associated with those positions. When you look at the percent wage and salary change for our far five largest groups over the course of about um, seven or eight years here, uh, what you see is the consumer price index that would have been total. These are totals in gray down at the bottom of almost 21%. You can see what's happened with our foundation uh, per pupil allowance that's been reduced over those number of years by just a hair over 3%. And you see by, uh, for our OPs, these again are some of the totals over that year. Uh, they've received a 2.8% increase. You see teachers have received a 6.2% increase, admin 5.3% and paras uh, based on their step one wages of 7.6%. Recommendations for the unaffiliated and the affiliated employee compensation is pay a stipend of 250 to each administrator and 150 to each teacher with a highly effective rating on his or her annual evaluation. Unless those employees in those two groups receive the highly effective rating, they wouldn't receive it. You may be asking yourself why there's a difference in those two figures, and if you think about it, it's based on years or based on number of days worked. Our teachers would work 186. If you're full-time administrator, you'd be working um, 260 days. We're also recommending the increase um, to increase the district paid state retirement contribution from 24.46% to 27.37 for those employees who first worked before July 1st, 2010. And then from 23.23% to 26.14% for those who first work on or after July 1st, 2010. A lot of that's dictated by some new regulations and legislation that was passed at the, um, by our legislature in the past couple of years. Um, with this, I'm going to hand it. Um, um, oh, I'll also review the percentage contribution of gross wages for premium sharing. This is not news to our board, but we wanted our community to see this as well. For administrators and teachers, for single person coverage, they'd be paying 1.75% for uh, an employee plus one, 2.5%, or if they have full family coverage, it's 3%. I'll distinguish for you, that's not 3% of the premium, it's actually 3% or whatever the percentage would be to apply of their gross dollars that would, they would make for this coming school year. And you can see what it is for building managers for the Masespa group for MFP and then on affiliates, not listed above, managers, office professionals, workstation techs, et cetera, uh, you can see what those percentages are. Premium sharing and ag aggregate, the employee contributions in 12 and 13 will cover 14% of the estimated cost of all health benefits, 
And since the contribution is based on a percent of wages, the percent of premium or the illustrative rates, as we like to refer to them, vary by employee. The typical administrator will be paying what some, most people would consider 21% of their premium if we had a premium. The typical teacher would be paying 15%. The typical peer pro would be paying 3%. This um, salary letter has been, uh, the contents of the salary letter have been reviewed with your facilities finance and operations study committee. We always run that thinking by them. Um, they've supported the recommendation and we bring it to you for an actionable item tonight. And then once we have that, we'll, we'll um, move on to Linda. Linda, do you want to tack on anything in addition to what I said? No? Okay. Move so, cool. <clears throat> Moved by Mr. Oley and support by Dr. Kaminsky on item 4.2. Any questions or discussions? Just one small question. If you go back a slide, the percent of the total premium costs, what would, because the manager percent, which is so much higher, what would a manager be in the, if they would put a manager on this list? Because it was like 6 or 7% on the previous one of their salary. Do you know offhand, Linda, roughly? Uh, there are some managers who are paying between 40 and 50% of the cost of really? the premium. Yes. Between 40 and 50%. And I think it's worth noting that that was a decision made last year through the salary letter. And the thinking there was we had been looking at reducing the building managers from 12 to 11 month contracts. And they came forward and offered this in lieu of that because they felt that it was important to be on site 12 months rather than 11. Okay. No, I remember that. Yep. Wow. And Linda, I may have walked into your, some of your slides because I know um, I may have done that, and if I do, I apologize. So if there's anything else that you intended to nope. add on any of those, please feel free to do so. Any other comments or questions? Can you just clarify something for me? The, yep. the retirement one with the percents, and we're voting on this. So what happens if we don't vote for that? I mean, because isn't it state mandated? I guess I'm just confused where. That is state mandated. Oh, OK. So. It, it's really just a statement of what we're doing with wages. Oh, OK. But All right. Unfortunately, no, you really don't have a choice. <laughs> right. That's what, well, I was thinking that, but I was like, clarify for that. But for it is that. important to note as it affects the, the overall wages and benefits. Yep. OK. The but, but to that point, uh, Angela, you make a good point. The, we will pay in 20% of wages for the retirement. The teachers and other staff are paying 3% of their wages towards retirement. Do I have that right? Uh, there, it depends on which plan, plan they're, they're, in. They, they're right. in. There are some who are pay, already paying close to 10. Everyone is paying at least 3. Yes. So, so it's somewhere so between, between, somewhere three between and 10. 30 and 37% of every dollar we pay people. We have, to, we have to pay an additional 37 cents for every dollar we pay people up to for the retirement. I just want people to realize how big mm -hmm. that is. That is a lot of money going to the retirement pot. It is. That 14% that number, what would it have been last year, do you remember? I just wonder how big an increase we had going into the new year budget. Uh, very, very significant increase because premium sharing was one of the concessions right. in the, the MCEA contract with the teachers. And it probably ooh. That'd be a pretty low number. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the total amount for the district is a little over a million dollars. And because of the teacher's contribution and the size of that labor right. pool, that's between eight and nine hundred thousand yeah, dollars of probably. contribution. I think all groups combined were a hundred twenty three thousand last year yeah. out of yeah. so it would have been 6. a couple percentage points if that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That that was a significant concession. Um, Mr. Wasserman, I would just mention that this salary letter that I think all of you uh, had included in your board packet, it is a great reference guide for yep. you to keep, especially for our new board members, because it identifies length of work year for all the different employees, what their contribution rate is, what ranges are um, within those salary ranges. We refer to it all the time, or if the rest of us lose our copy, we go to Mrs. Klein and, <laughs> and she finds it for us. But it's a great reference document because you may get questions out in the community about um, this action tonight and most of the answers are there. Yep. We of course would be there to support you and help you if you want to use us as resource. And I echo that Carl. I have a little binder at home along with the budget summaries, every budget presentations every year so I can quickly refer to get a reference point. So it's really good when you get asked a particular question. The slide here is just really noteworthy. I mean this is really significant change. And significant change. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? See none, we'll move into a vote. 
All in favor of approval of 4.2 uh, salary letter adjustments for this year, say aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. And now we're moving on to information uh, points from Mrs. Klein. Yes. Uh, at this meeting, it, this is the first rollout of the 2012-13 budget. And it will be presented this evening. We posted in the newspaper that we would have a public hearing, which we need to do in order to move ahead with establishing our tax rates. And then it will come back to you for approval at the next meeting. At the next meeting, you'll have a second budget to approve, and that is the final amendment to the 2011-12 budget. And in the preparation of this one, I modified a few numbers that I know are going to be changing. You may not see them in the official budget, but I'll talk to you where those occur. We have some additional revenues coming from the Intermediate School District, for example. Uh, and rather than go back and rely on the January figures, I did go ahead and incorporate those here. Uh, but our timeline is we had the budget workshop on April 30th and presented to you a preliminary view of what it looked like based on what we knew at that time. This evening we have the budget that comes to you and the public hearing and then you'll be asked to take action on it by June 25th. That is important because by state law we have to have a board approved budget in place when our fiscal year begins on July 1. Looking ahead to the end, this is what it looks like. Revenues will be almost $3 million lower than in the current year, $75,000 or $75,650,490. Expenditures, we've also reduced. And these figures, <clears throat> I will say the revenues are right within the range of what we looked at back in April, where we had three different budgets on the table, we, or proposals. We had the, the executive version, the governor's proposal, the House, and the Senate. That's all been settled. So at least the revenue side is based on solid state aid figures. State Aid Act has been passed. We can count on these numbers. Uh, and that 75.6 is within the range of what we looked at. The expenditures are significantly lower because the April 30th meeting was before we had a contract with the teachers. And so what you looked at that, that time was a budget that did not include any concessions. I believe all I did on the expenditure side is I added the teachers I knew we needed for all day kindergarten and stepped everyone, uh, I think it was maybe two steps, and, and that was it. The contract with the teachers changed that significantly. And if you were to go back and compare the numbers, you'd see about a $4 million change much lower than it was. So as a result, our expenditures are actually lower th than in the current year, expected to be $82,696,904. Uh, the shortfall between the revenues and expenditures has increased, but I'm also including for you the expected budget variance. And this is based on history. I know that at this time of year, we can generally expect about a 2% variance, and I've been tracking that since January, and I believe we're on target to hit that. I'll have a much better idea for you at the next meeting. Uh, but that would mean that our actual operating deficit for this year is almost $2.9 million, not the 4.5 that you see there. And for next year, it would be $4,152,023 instead of the $7 million that you're seeing there. So, the operating deficit has increased, and that is primarily the result of the change in the retirement rate. Which you'll get to see some figures on that in a minute. Uh, the history of the general fund shows where our revenues have been for the last few years. And you'll notice that since 2008-9 to this current day, our revenues have dropped by $11 million. Our expenditures, about $3.5 million. And our fund balance uh, has been all over. And this is the entire fund balance, not just the spendable portion. Graphically, it looks like this. And the bars represent the total dollar amount of the fund balance. And you can see way back in about the 0102 or 023, 
fiscal year, we had close to $20 million in our fund balance. The choppy line is what percent of general fund expenditures that is. And the two numbers are important together because a very small fund balance may actually represent a larger percent because as the expenditures decline. Uh, so you do need to look at both. But you can see that in the current year, uh, the fund balance is over 15% expected to drop somewhat below that at the end of this fiscal year, and then would drop just slightly below 10 for next year. And here's where the figures came from in determining the variance going forward. And because we do budget amendments throughout the year and a number of items change, what compared the original budget, the final budget, that would be the one that gets approved at the very last meeting in June, and then where we are with the audit. And looking back, I can see that the audit as a percent of the very first budget that was adopted, if we disregard the 0708 year, which is very unusual because we had an MCV tax appeal that <laughs> required a $5.7 million payment, uh, if I take that out, we can expect if history is uh, any kind of indicator here, that when we reach this point next year, or about two months later, we will find that our, between, uh, the, the difference between our expenditures and our revenues will have meant we've had a, a variance of about 96.5%. And it could come on either side. We could receive additional revenues, or we could spend less. And every year has something different happen. So I can't go forward and say, well, I always know that this number comes in lower, or I always know that this number comes in higher. I just know that somewhere between those two, there's likely to be something that causes a variance of that size. But then when we get to the end of the year, it's more like 98%. So for figuring the fund balance that will be available on June 30th of this year to go forward, I use the 98% variance. And then for figuring where it would be on June 30th to 2013, I used 96.5%. Linda, on the, I don't know it was the previous slide or two slides where you're looking at fund balance as a percentage, that graph where it looks like we are in the 25% range, was that because of tax appeal stuff, reserves? Uh, I, I just don't remember those numbers being that high. Uh, in that was, let's see, that looks like it was the 0203. There was a time where we had, I believe, eight or nine million dollars set aside for tax appeal. Yeah, okay. Reserves. That's I just I figured yeah. that was so, the reason. So. Yes, that that was a that was big portion of Artificial inflation because mm -hmm. of that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then you can see in some earlier years it was equally as high, but the overall dollar amount was lower, right. and it's because overall expenditures yep. were lower. So. Yeah, I can put a little historical reference on it when I joined the board. In the 03, July of 03, I think that was about the last year that we put money into the fund balance to keep up with the anticipated settlement. Remember, it was growing and compounding. Right. And after that, we said, that's enough. Right. We're not going to milk current programs. Right. We, we had a fairly elaborate yeah, formula that, that. that we used to determine right. what we needed to set aside. And we finally reached the point where we weren't able to <coughs> do that without gutting programs right, in order right. to set aside any anticipation of that. Yep. So. so the major assumptions on the revenue side. Enrollment, a decline of 1.4%. And this is the blended count. Current year is 8,216 pupils. Expect next year 8,102. And that includes what we're anticipating as a bounce of maybe 30 kindergartners. Uh, in reflection of moving to the all-day program. Foundation, as set in the State Aid Act, is going to be flat for us. You may have seen in the news that there are districts that are going to receive $120 additional per pupil. We would not be in that category. I'm so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> we just pay it. Uh, <laughs> MIPSR's <laughs> offset, this is a figure that's provided by the House Fiscal Agency with an estimate for every district. And it's essentially the same dollar amount for us, although I, they estimated for 12-13 an additional $60. And I, I don't know where that came from. And honestly, it's just their best estimate at the time because it will be based on what percent of the entire school payrolls statewide Midland Public's payrolls are on September 30th. 
So they're, they're using estimates of estimates as well, but that's their figure, uh, which is, in essence, no change. There is a new best practices incentive, and I'll have details on that for you later. It's less money than in the current year and a different set of best practices than in the current year. I, I think I, it's seven out of eight. I know we meet at least six. I think we'll meet seven, so I went ahead and included the figure in this year's beginning budget. But again, the House fiscal estimate for us is $414,900 down from the $822,033 that was in this year's. So they took uh, quite a bit of money out of a best practices incentive and I think used it to supplement the foundation for those districts that were at the basic level. Uh, the next figure comes to us from the ESA and this is a Medicaid reimbursement that we are reimbursed for our staff providing Medicaid reimbursable students to special education students. And this is one where I brought new knowledge to the budget, which is not currently in the January budget. Uh, in the January budget is a figure of just slightly over $300,000. In our most recent conversations with the ESA, they've indicated that they had a one-time settlement of money that went back to 2008-9, and they are going to distribute that to the locals, and they're going to divide it over two years. So for this current year, they've told us to expect about 304,000. So this number is about twice what we expected. And for next year, they have 297,000 of that distribution, as well as an estimate of 489,000 for us. So since these are estimates provided by an outside entity, of course, they're always subject to change. But what we use at this time of year is, whoops, and yeah. that is Okay, I correct. you saw my puzzled look. <laughs> yes, I did, and I'm thinking, what would be Thank confusing? You. And uh, no, that's actually an increase. <laughs> uh, the federal programs, we're always told at this time of year to expect or budget no more than 85% of the current year. And then once the application process is complete and the allocation at the federal level, Typically, that number changes. The overall effect on our budget, though, it should be a wash because every federal dollar has to be supplemental. So if that number goes up, expenses also have to go up. And so it works out not quite uh, a 15% reduction, but, but pretty close with the Title I and Title IIA combined. And then the enhancement millage, this is also a figure that's provided by the ESA because mm. they're the fiscal agent for that. And their expectation was a 1.9% reduction in uh, what's there. Linda, a question on the last one, and you may not know, just as a curiosity. Is that due to reductions in property values on the revenues brought in, or is it the difference in our split of students throughout the county? I believe it's just based on their estimate of property tax values. And okay. again, that one is adjusted once the actual values are posted okay. in the end of August. And also, it will depend on what portion, because it is allocated on a per pupil. So I think what they did in doing that calculation is they just estimated what the overall pot would look like and applied that reduction to all districts without trying to anticipate okay. what might happen to our enrollments. Okay. And that's a good segue into enrollment because enrollment is such a huge driver of our revenues. You know, it's enrollment times the foundation generates pretty close to 85 or 90 percent of all of our revenue. Uh, it's important to go back and look at where we've been. And I've been going back to the 0809 for our comparisons because that was the last year of what I would call full funding for Midland Public. And that'll show up on some other slides. That was the last year where we had all of our 20J. That was the highest per pupil funding that we have seen. And it's cliched, but it's all been downhill from there. Uh, so it's worth looking at where we were. And elementary, you can see the decline. Because of uh, adding back some kindergartners, elementary really seems to be evening out. Uh, we've seen over, well, since 08, 09, almost 400 pupils. But the last couple of years, we would expect those to be pretty close. 
And these are the full-time equivalents. This isn't necessarily the headcount. And we won't know for certain what these numbers are until they're certified in November. But these are the estimates that we're using at this point. And we work with the enrollment estimator or consultant that we've used for, I think, at this point, decades. Uh, secondary, again, a reduction. And we're beginning to see the smaller elementaries have their effect at the secondary level. Special education, estimate of 436. So our total enrollment in the fall, we would expect to be 8,099 pupils. And that will lead to a blended count of 8,102. Now the blended count is what the state uses for the allocation of dollars. And they take 10% of our official spring count, February count, and add to it 90% of the fall count. So since we have declining enrollment, 10% of our spring is slightly gives us a little bump up from where we are. If it were reversed, we would actually see our blended count slightly smaller than our, our fall head count. This is a point of reference. It's just rough numbers and doesn't probably make much sense to keep talking about what if. But if you look at this three or four-year time horizon here, in the blended count, we lost 860 students. Multiply the foundation of ground, That's we'd be in a break-even budget right now. Yes. We're very close to it. Just on enrollment, right? Yeah. There, there's a Wishful lot thinking. of things that you'll see that will say, if only, yeah. we, we would be better than a break-even budget. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the change since 0809 has been a 16% overall drop in enrollment. But the good news is, is that you can see it's beginning to dwindle. It's 1.2%. In, in your Last demographics, said. We're, you know, as we go through budget, we do them demographics first and the birth rates, et cetera. I'm not surprised to start where the elementary is. Yes, we're getting a little kick from the full-time kindergarten. We'll probably see a little decrease yet if I remember the demographics right. But it starts leveling out. Yeah, it really does. Uh, the, the one big unknown, and it, it made me not even want to look ahead to 1314 in a sense that it would be pointless to try to generate the number is the legislature right now is talking about changing the kindergarten starting date from December 1 back to September 1. Uh -oh. And if that takes effect, we could see a drop of 25% of our kindergartners in a single year. And then, of course, that smaller class would roll forward for the next 13 years. Is that a tactic it, for the state to save money? Uh, that would be part of it, but I think the stated belief is that perhaps there are children who are entering kindergarten who really aren't ready aren't for ready. kindergarten. And so it's that's supposed, supposed to be one phased in, though, yeah. over a three-year period awesome. of time. Uh, there's been different proposals, but yeah. that would be one possibility, that the month would move back one, one, month, at one month at a time. <laughs> oh. So we would lose one-twelfth of our kindergarten class for each year. But that, that is an unknown out there that could change this picture for next year. And what's interesting about that is right now, the way the law is, you don't have to send your child to kindergarten if they're five by December 1st, if you, if you choose to hold them back. You don't have to. You're not required to. But it's not, that's not very well known. Yeah. Kindergarten isn't mandatory in Michigan. The mandatory attendance age is six. Uh, here's the picture okay. of what enrollment has looked like going back a couple of decades. 94-95 was the beginning of Proposal A, so that's always a good benchmark for us. And you can see that at that time, we're a little over 9,000 students, uh, gradually climbed. We had a little dip here in part because we had students in an alternative program that had been counted in our district and then ended up... Uh, Attendance auditor said no, they needed to be counted in another district. So we didn't really see that type of decline in our buildings, but that, that's what caused that little blip. But peaked here at 9,657 students in the blended count, and it's been dropping ever since. It's leveling out a little bit here because of the expectation of some additional kindergartners. Uh, but I think we're probably not too far from bottoming out, assuming there's no change in kindergarten. I would expect maybe the next three, four years will stabilize at around 7,800 students. And Linda, uh, if you go back, uh, I've refreshed people's memories, and I may speak to wrong numbers. 
that 8,100 includes a little under 500 out of district school choice kids, right? Correct. Which would leave 7,600 in district students. Mm -hmm. And if I remember right from past data you showed us, to get 7,600 in district <laughs> students, we have to go way back into the late 50s. <laughs> yeah, I think correct? you're right. And, and so, That's... apples to apples, our enrollment in district next year is going to be roughly equivalent to what Midland Public Schools enrollment was in the late 50s or early 60s. You just have to offset a little bit by the kids that are leaving here, the 300 or whatever the number is. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. Because the net, exactly. the net yeah. is about 200. Yeah. Maybe, maybe but it still yeah. puts us in that same, yeah. still puts yeah. in that same yeah. ballpark. And I just remember when you showed the data, it, you had to go way, you had yeah. to go decades and decades back to be that small. Yeah. yeah. In fact, back in, I think it was the late 60s or very early 70s, Midland Public had more than 12,000 resident students. Yeah. Wow. So very, very different place. That 8102 also includes approximately 40 full-time equivalents that we receive credit for because we are providing auxiliary instruction right. at some of the parochial schools. Right. And although for any given student it's just a tiny portion of their instructional week, all of that adds up right. and we receive about credit for a little over 40. Well, one time we didn't have that at all. No. Yeah. No, that, that was a, a, I would say a fairly recent change. I think probably just in the last 15 years yeah. or so that we've yeah. been able to do that. Uh, so here's the 50,000 foot view of revenues. We, they break down into four categories. Our local sources are our local millages as well as investments which are almost non-existent to date. At one time they were close to eight or nine hundred thousand dollars in this current year. They are below 40. A couple of reasons for that, but the largest being the dismal state of interest rates uh, that we have faced for the last few years. Uh, state sources are the per pupil foundation as well as all of the categoricals, so the best practices money would be there, the Mitzer's offset, Federal sources would be uh, the federal Title I, Title IIA, as well as some federal monies that flow from the intermediate school district through us. And then incoming transfers and other transactions. Transfers are monies that go from either one fund to another or from one government to another. So the enhancement millage is in that category. And one of the reductions, whoops, there, whoa. wrong way, is due to the loss of kindergarten complement. With the full day program, we're no longer able to offer the kindergarten complement program, which was fee-based. It's been very successful for us, and the last couple of years, it has transferred a profit of over $100,000 a year into the general fund. So that's part of what's there. Local and state, you, you may wonder why is state down so much and local is up so much here. That's primarily a function of local taxable values <clears throat> and this current year was very unusual because we had yet another MCV taxable value settlement that did some very strange things uh, in how it affected both our local property tax rate and our uh, state state reimbursements and we've been over all of that but it ended up with about a million dollars of one-time revenues and some of that came through state some of it we had to reduce a tax rate next year that tax rate is able to go back up somewhat uh, so between the two that that's where the changes are taking place but overall revenue decline of about 3.2 million dollars and then maybe just make a comment for some of the new board members and maybe I'm the only one here other than Betty maybe remembers a day where local sources generated what? 95% of our revenue? Yes. Remember that, Betty? <laughs> <laughs> when, when we finalize our budget for this current year, just to clarify for the audience, the there's definitely going to be us dipping in the fund balance for this oh, yes. year. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when I look at that bottom number on the right, that's an additional dip beyond what we're doing this year when we go into 12-13. 
This is, this That's just revenue. revenue. That's yeah, just revenue. This is just revenue. revenue. Yeah. So this isn't but, deficit. This, it's not. But certainly, the point was yes. certainly for the 12, 13 year, much greater dip into yes. fund equity. Yes. We're not adding anything to that. No, no. That I, I no, realize that's point nine million. Slide. Expected. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that yeah, was the, the earlier slide. Right. The budget's at seven million. The expected variance, which is kind of a yeah. new designation, which we're glad we're doing, is two point nine. That's best scenario. Yes. pretty much. Unless yeah. there's you some windfall for some source of anticipation. If you want to. Yeah. Let's. I think that's really a key number. Yeah, there's everything we've done. One more. Definitely a lot more pressure on the fund there equity. We are. There, there it is. Yeah. Next year, some this year. Yes. Definitely pressure. Yeah. Three year. million this year. Four yep. million next year. Mm -hmm. And we're not adding to fund equity. That's definitely still a pretty tight numbers we are, at this point because we know the state numbers for this yeah. next year. Even with the new contract, <coughs> we are spending more money oh. than we are bringing. Without the new contract, it'd have been a lot worse. This number would have been pretty close to expected. You know, all the fund balance that Gone. we have. Yep. Yeah, but let, let, I think it's really important. This is really a key slide to focus on. This is, you know, if we manage our expenses like we have historically, you know, and get it down to the 96, 97 percent, we're still dealing with a four million dollar deficit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So now you take that. I don't want to. You know, be the pessimist here, but you take that forward. You know, unless there's some other opportunity for us to reduce reduce cost, or we get some additional revenue from foundation allowance or other sources, take that four million now and carry it out for how many more years can we afford to do that before there's no fund balance? I mean, that's exactly. the scary thing here. Exactly for everything we've done, including the new contract, we're still four million dollars. Yep. That's that suspenses over revenue. So that's the best case. That's assuming we can manage the ninety-six and a half percent. Yes. And if we and if we don't, it's another million if it's 98 instead yeah, of 96. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing fundamentally different next year other than the contract language on the, um, on the formula that could offset some of this. So the formula yeah, of the contract yes. could offset really? some of it, but it will be, not offset all of it. There could be an additional 2% reduction in the cost of the contract. Uh, also, there could be, we'll talk more about retirement later, but as it's on paper right now in the State Aid Act, the retirement rate is scheduled to go up almost four percentage points next yeah. oh. year. Yeah. That's close to a $2 million increase right. for us. So yeah, just think about the retirement thing versus any potential formula impact from the contract, yeah. and the retirement's going to outweigh that substantially Probably. in all likelihood. Now, Chances are very good that there will be some reform that changes that, and it could take two forms. It could reduce our rate, but depending on what's called for in the legislation, it could also encourage people to retire, in which case our costs may also drop. Yeah. If we have people who have experienced they're at the high end of their salary schedule, wherever, whatever their employee group is, that can turn around expenses in a yeah. heartbeat. But we are betting that something is going to change so we don't continue that run rate yep. beyond this next year, right? I mean, yeah. Cause otherwise, because right now we won't be solvent. Right now we will be, yeah, unless we, unless something changes. That's right. And, and Linda, I'm sorry, can you go back? I think it's yeah. two slides. But do you show the fund balance history, not in that graph? And wasn't there a table the next couple of years? Uh, there it is. So when you see 12, 13 end with the 96% and a known revenue stream today that's pretty positive, a known cost stream that's pretty, I mean, it's pretty solid, we're going to have a fund equity of $7.5 million at the end of next total. year. Total. Uh -huh. Total fund balance. And with another, if that four million continues the following year, I would tell you we're going to be essentially break even at yep. seven point five. Yep. But we're going to have to do something more right. to offset that. Yeah, yeah. And Linda, what, what percent uh, would that fund balance be at seven point five? About two uh, percent or something like that. Nine point one percent, I believe. So getting down below ten percent, mm -hmm. not a fourteen yeah, percent no. or anything like yep. that. Okay. That's kind of the new normal for MPS going forward. 
well, would be optimistic. There, that oh, would be yeah. optimistic because there's no nothing that says <laughs> the next one will be down yeah, to four to five. That would be a hope. <laughs> hope is not a strategy. The new <laughs> normal is below 10. 10 percent. Closer to five. I think this is where we left off. And that's the end of the revenue discussion. Uh, well, no, I take that back. Uh, just one historical picture, a couple, maybe a broader picture, of what the Per Pupil Foundation has looked like in terms of revenue sources. And if I had taken this back, well, prior to the passage of Proposal A, there was no such thing as the foundation right. allowance. We lived off of whatever our local property tax generated. And if we had more pupils, it just meant that there was few, fewer dollars per pupil. And if we had fewer pupils, more dollars per pupil. Uh, but since P Proposal A, we've had the foundation allowance. And you can see back in our high year, it was $8,904. It's now down to $8,141, which is where it's been. And we've had our local hold harmless millage generating $415.31 per pupil. That's a fixed amount. It has been fixed since 1994. Our, hold, our, our local millage, which is on the non-homestead, or it's called non-principal residence, non-principal resident exemption properties, the non-PREs, uh, generates that amount. And that's a function of changes in local taxable value and changes in classifications of property that are or are not included. But in general, it's 18 mills on the non-PRE properties and six mills on commercial properties. And homesteads are exempt from everything except that 415. Uh, so our local funding, which was indeed well over 90% in prior years, is not quite 32% expected for this coming year and it is somewhat higher than in the current year because of some of that shifting uh, between state aid and, and local. Uh, the state now provides 68.2 percent of our revenue and 0809 was the last year where there was the section 20J payment and section 20J of the state school aid act was enacted to ensure that all districts receive the same dollar amount per pupil increase. That was repealed, and so now we are capped at a percentage increase, and there's been a return to what's called the 2x <coughs> formula. Well, there had been a return this year. You know, I guess I would call it the 0x formula because we're getting nothing, and other districts are getting $120. Uh, but that was a line item vetoed by Governor Granholm, and although we've worked over the years with like districts to try to have something reinstated, it's not looking particularly optimistic at this time. So that was a permanent funding loss for all of us in, in the uh, 20J consortium. This loss was $470 per pupil, and that was applied across the board for all districts. And it, again, it was not done on a percentage basis. It was a flat 470 So in defense of the districts receiving 120 this year, they're not getting anywhere close to what they lost. Linda, what percent of just rough number. What percent of districts got a $120 increase and what percent did not? Uh, I would have to guess that the percent receiving it is probably, receiving the full 120 may be close to 70 percent. I'd have to check my numbers because it's those at the basic foundation. Uh, there are some that are between that and what's considered the maximum foundation of $8,019 and they get a sliding amount. Oh. Okay. So something less than the 120, and then anybody over 8,019 yes. gets zero. Jerry, there's roughly 560 public school districts, and I think the number they got, the 120 or some percent of that, was 483. Yeah. When that news hit, though, they combined um, other kinds of academies and so on, and it was a number of like 483 out of 800 and something. and. Um, they made it look better than what it really was. Okay. So yeah. going back to my reference on the enrollment slide where we lost 860, whatever the number was, and what that was worth to us, now just look at the foundation allowance oh. there. So that's you know 760 in the foundation allowance. So what ifs? It's a dreamland now. If we had had foundation allowance had not gone down, enrollment stayed flat, my goodness, what a different, we'd have all our programs reinstated. Plus, we'd be able we'll to be take care of our employees in a better way than what we've been able to do it. I mean, it's like, when you look at these slides, it's like the perfect storm of why we always knew that Proposal A was going to come back to really bite us. The 
combination of decreased enrollment hurts us and decreased foundation allowance hurts us. And the old way of doing things, enrollment would not have hurt us as much and we would have been subject to the desire of our voters on mm -hmm. what that millage was. So that's right. Really, yeah. the deck is a, definitely $15 million dollars worth between these two issues mm -hmm. just because proposal A. I mean, that maybe it's just really a rough kind of throwing number out, but don't you yeah. think? It's in that neighborhood. Uh, next two, I think, will really enforce what, what you're talking about, Rick. Uh, I compared our annual growth in the foundation allowance, that's the gray bars, with the state minimum foundation allowance, and those are the blue bars. The asterisk indicates that these are the stated values, but we had three years, 0203, 0304, and 910, where no one's foundations were fully funded. So on paper, they appear at the levels they were here, but the actual foundation might have been somewhat lower. But you can see that the percent increase, because these were, uh, many of them were just flat dollar amounts, were much larger for districts that were at the minimum. And they continued to get increases. Uh, no one had anything during this time period. Uh, this year, this was 2009-10, that's where we lost the 20J money. And other districts were held flat. Last year, because it was a flat $470 per pupil reduction, it was actually a larger percentage reduction for the minimum districts than it was for us. And then in this year, nothing for MPS and not quite 2% for the districts at the minimum. But this has definitely favored the districts with the lower foundation. Yep. And, and Linda, to put some dollar numbers to that, I don't know if you're going to do that. If you are, I'll hold off the question. My is currently we're getting what roughly total eight thousand some dollars a student. Yeah. If I remember 80, right, 41. eighty one. Mm -hmm. And if I went to other districts that were getting the full blue bars most of the time, they're at what now? Uh, they were at sixty eight seventy five. So I think they're going to sixty nine twenty. I, I had in my head they'd be at seven thousand with the increase. So I was pretty close. So. The gap is now $1,000 a student. If you went back to the first years, gap was that much gap much. Oh. was thousands of dollars That's different right. per student. Right. So when our folks in our community wonder why we're doing, to Rick's point earlier, what we've been having to do, our funding is gravitating to the mean yeah. rapidly. Uh, no end in sight. And it's hard to offer differentiated programs, differentiated pay. And everything else when you're the same as everybody else. Well, that was one of the objectives of Proposal A. It right? was. Never mind, level the playing field, yep. if you will, yeah. so to I, speak. And I don't think anyone really anticipated that equity meant bringing down. That's right. Bringing down rather than bringing up. Well, when the state economy is going this direction, you have no choice but to do that, right? I mean, yep. it Not to confuse the issue, and I don't know if you're going to talk about retirement costs, but this is pretty much out of our control. So then you take the retirement costs, which pretty much out of our control is increased expenses mandated to us, coupled with this, and those combination of things out of our control mandated by the state have been devastating to us. Devastating. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is my least or most favorite graph, but it's probably the one that uh, makes me the most angry. <laughs> and the gray bars, again, represent our foundation per pupil since the onset of Proposal A. Uh, the yellow bar is what that foundation would be had it just kept pace with the inflation rate. I ran our foundation through the Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI calculator to come up with these figures. And I've done a little bit of the same kind of math that Rick did. I took the difference here between our 8141 and this over $10,500 foundation times even our current number right. of pupils right. and the figure 20 million. is $24 million. Yeah. Dollars. Yep. Yep. Unbelievable. To me, that says it all. Sure does. <sighs> Cheer your picture. We'll just take a step back from that. Uh, here's the picture of what revenue looks like. You can see the state portion makes up 64.4%. You may say that's a little different figure than uh, the earlier one. The earlier one was just showing the per-pupil funding. This is out of all revenue. So you can see federal, not quite 2% of all of our revenues. Transfers, including that enhancement millage, not quite 6%.
our local property tax is about a quarter of all our revenues, and then the other little locals add up to 2.6. I will say the enhancement millage is a large portion of this. So this, remember that figure of 3.2 or 3.3 million, this number would be much smaller without that enhancement millage. We'll shift to expenditures. And we have done a pretty good job on expenditures this year, uh, in large part because of the settlement with the MCEA, as well as some of the other changes that we've put in place over the prior years. Even with the additional teachers that we've needed for the all-day kindergarten program, our salary costs almost flat, but actually somewhat reduced which is pretty impressive. Our staff FTE is up, and it's up primarily in the teachers, and then also in our paraprofessionals. And the paraprofessionals I dug into, because that struck me as a fairly large increase, and there were two components of that. One is the special education paraprofessionals, which are typically called for in an IEP, and the other is, again, tied to the all-day kindergarten issue, where we had been able to use our federal dollars to offer an extended program at our Title I schools, and we had teachers in that program. We can't do that now, and so Title I is going to be using its dollars differently. So the number is increased, but a lot of those are going to be funded with federal dollars. The salaries are not offset by the benefit contribution right now, is that correct? Correct. Because okay. no. I would have thought there would have been a lower number. Oh, no, this, this is just purely the salaries. You'll, you'll be seeing the benefits uh -huh. in a minute. Uh, and a couple of functions on the teacher contract, uh, and that took many forms. There was the 2% overall reduction, mm -hmm. and there's the three furlough days. Right. Some of the other features, such as the benefit contribution, show up in other places of the budget. Okay. So uh, the elimination of the conference day, for example, that reduced the purchase service category. That wasn't in salaries. Um, the benefit contribution is showing up in the cost of benefits. So it, it, it's scattered throughout. Uh, but even with that, the fact that we were actually able to hold salaries or keep it slightly lower with an, the increase in FTE that we knew that we needed for kindergarten was pretty impressive. Uh, and it's really at very little change. Uh, the teacher, students per teacher ratio is down just the tiniest bit, but you can see it's still higher than we were a few years ago. And the students per administrator, again, um, down just the tiniest bit because of changes in enrollment. And then the middle line shows all of our certificated staff, and that's teachers and administrators together. But you can see that uh, there was a time when we had a fairly sizable number of administrators, which kept an administrator to or students to administrator ratio really quite low, and we've increased that up into the 14 to 16 range the last few years. That's interesting with the building closures. <laughs> I would have expected that to be a bigger decrease. Uh, for the students or the administrators? Administrators. Well, with the building closures, remember, we anticipated that, and so we only had half-time half -time. principals. Oh, that's right. That's right. We, we took it out yeah. of the system. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Uh, another component of expenditures, and I've broken down insurances and payroll taxes separately. So this is what's in the... 11-12 uh, budget, almost $8 million for all insurances combined. And here's where we are next year. And it breaks down into our self-funded medical plan, significantly lower uh, in large part because of the employee contributions. This is assuming similar utilization as this year? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And dental, we moved to self-funded this year. So this was the first year that we had any kind of history and based on the history that we had this year, our third-party administrators said they expect our claims next year to actually be lower. Oh. I said, fine, I'll take it. 
And Vision, also, that, it, that one is a, a true insurance product, and the premium on that dropped as well. So a very good picture Step, on the, the insurance side. But Linda, the, before you move off that slide, e either the year before I joined the district, which would have been six years ago or seven years ago, there was a pretty significant bump over what we thought self-funded medical expenditures were going to be. Do you recall if that was because we had a number of cases that hit stop loss or what the cause of that was? Because always in the back of my, mi my mind, I worry that we've gotten off very lucky for five years in a row with our health care costs. And what happens if yeah. we have a $2 million swing from what we think it is going to be? Yeah. You know, are we living on luck here in terms of our health care costs? <laughs> or what caused that $2 million, if you recall? And maybe there, you don't. There was a couple. Uh, it, I think it was some. There's a couple big neonate. Significant. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, but still, we have a stop loss, though. Yeah. yeah. And it was multiple premature, yeah. uh, severely premature births, okay. I believe, was one major yeah. component of that. Those tend to be very expensive. Right. Our, our carriers have told us that premature births, brains, traumatic brain injury, uh, or burns, excuse me, traumatic brain injury tend to be large. Our experience has been uh, definitely the premature births, and then we've had some uh, very uh, prolonged chronic serious illnesses that have sometimes contributed over the years as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're right, statistically, it Old could rights. happen. Yeah. And that's a $2.7 million difference between the two years, so that's significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but while you're basking in the glow of those reduced costs, <laughs> you need to look at what's happening on the payroll side. And here's where the October 1 MIPSERS rate shows up. You can see our payroll taxes, even though our salaries are going to be mm, down to slight, almost flat, our payroll taxes are going up 10%. And that is because of this increase in the rate. This is a percent of payroll that we pay. So up until October 1, we'll be paying 24.46% for most of our employees. After that, 2737 So for the different employee groups, I calculate a blended rate based on the number of pays they have before and after October 1. Uh, but even with all of that, you can see the expectation is that we'll go from 11.1 million in this current year to almost 12.6 million. And then, as you would expect, Social Security is pretty much the same. Do you have a historical graph for the MIPSERS rate, by any chance? Uh, no, I didn't include just that. Go back okay. 10 years, just for the sake of new board members. Yeah. 10 years ago, well, it would have been a what, 12%? I can I take know. it back 10 years, because that's when I started, and it was 12.99%. Yeah. I remember I remember 13, 12 14 when I started on the board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Linda, where, where's the source of the increased payroll taxes again? Uh, it's the MIPSERS. OK, th okay that's included yeah. in that. These two add up to the payroll taxes. Right. Okay, it's a payroll tax. So really, the increase is right there with the, the MIPSERS rate. Okay. So Linda, even with the reduced salaries, <laughs> our payroll staying relatively constant, like your 0.7% mm -hmm. showed. And that must be some step functions of steps. There's got to be some of that that's mm -hmm. raising that. And then a few more teachers because of the kindergarten mm -hmm. situation is driving that to stay balanced versus down. Mm -hmm. You know, just with the contract, I would expect those to be down versus flat. But well, remember, a set. lot of those concessions, too, were in places other than in the salaries. Right. You know, the the gotcha. premium contribution right. was a big portion of that, so you can't expect to see that full amount. With the 2%, I should. Yeah. 2% uh, of... Uh, but. 40% of our folks are on our steps. steps. Yeah. So, so roughly 65% is yeah. offsetting. Right. 40% of so 5% got a, 40 is 2%. 40% actually got an adjustment upward. Yeah. yeah. And if it's 40% at 5% step, that's 2% right. plus that's against right. the 2% that's right. minus. That's right. And that's right. Yep. We're yeah. balanced. Uh, so there are the major categories that we use in the budget, the salaries, the benefits, uh, and then the other categories, purchase services, supplies and materials, capital outlay, other, which are capital leases and gifts and the outgoing transfers. 
And overall, we've reduced expenses $462,714 over the current year. And I just wanted to point out there's an interplay between supplies and materials and gifts. Because at the time we do the January budget, many of the gifts have come in. And so they've been distributed into other categories, typically the supply accounts of the buildings that are purchasing the gifted items. Uh, then when we go to the new budget year, all of that comes back down into the gift category. So there's automatically $200,000 that's set aside in anticipation of gifts uh, for the 12-13, <coughs> plus I think 50000 maybe for athletic gifts. So I, in case you wondered why such a drop in supplies, but yet there's an increase over here, that's a big portion of it. And we did enter the new lease for the copiers, and I had reported to you in April that I thought there would be a higher figure associated with that. That actually ended up being somewhat lower <laughs> than, than we had anticipated. And the outgoing transfers are amounts that we pay out to other governments, and that's primarily the tuition that we pay to the ESA. And they have reduced somewhat the amount that they think we'll owe next year. So that, that contributes to that figure right there. And Linda, I've got to say it for the sake of our audience, capital outlay obviously are items we cannot do with sinking fund money, even if we wanted to. Mm, easily uh, close to half of that. Will be sinking fund? Will be, no, 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 oh. school buses. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and school buses are definitely not sinking fund approved. Right. And then probably the balance is technology. Computer. And that is also not right. sinking thank fund you. approved. And that's still with a, still a small reserve left in the state. Yeah, very little, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah, this is all general fund. Right, yep. right, exactly. So even with all of our best efforts, and we've reduced expenses 460 pounds, which is good, which is good. But all you got to do is look at the enrollment stuff and what that was worth to us, and then project one year from now when we're sitting here, and you say, where else are we going to get the expense reductions? I mean, that's just it's just going to be the challenge. Yep, it's a big challenge. Unless revenue enrollment changes direction. Uh, so here's the picture. These are the big functions of the district, and classroom instruction, as you would expect, is our largest share, 63.9%. Uh, student support, that would include uh, counselors, all the ancillary services that go with special education, psychologists, occupational therapists, et cetera. Instructional support, uh, that tends to be, uh, it's the curriculum area. It's also um, technology, instructional technology, some special education support. Uh, there's a fair amount of federal dollars in that category as well. Central does office. PP, does a PP um, professional development day get put into that? Yes. Edge? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, central office administration are the board of education expenses, and then the very basic central office administration, uh, building administration. That includes the administrators, their office professionals, any paraprofessionals that are working in the office. Instructional paras would be down here. And uh, any building-wide supplies that they purchase. Support services would be business and HR. And uh, data would uh, be the non-instructional side of technology. It's all there. And then everything else is in this catch-all category. Biggest share of that is maintenance, which includes utilities, transportation, then athletics, uh, and then the other and some of the, the outgoing transfers that are not over here. But this, this would be lease payments are captured in here. And athletics is the net number? No. 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 Okay. Uh, Due to a GASB change a few years ago, athletics is now included in revenue and yeah, in expense. expense. Okay. And so this is just the expense side. Expense side. I think okay. in the narrative I broke it out for you okay. and showed with the revenue and the expense. I think the net is like four or five hundred, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Neighborhood of half a million dollars. Yeah, yeah, it's substantially reduced from Yeah. It used to be well over a million. Yeah. Uh, and then if you want to look at it with the other slice. Salaries and benefits make up not quite 85% of the entire budget. And you can see salaries right there, about 56.8%.
We have the FICA, the retirement. Retirement is becoming a bigger and bigger piece of the pie. Uh, there was a time where retirement and medical each were about 8%. And you can see what's happened there. They're not only combined much larger, but medical is getting smaller as a result of the contribution, and retirement is getting quite a bit larger. Uh, all the other little benefits, life insurance, disability, et cetera, are fairly small. And then our other categories are our purchase services, our repairs and maintenance, our supplies, capital outlay, et cetera. So no real change in the overall percent of the budget that's people dedicated, but what you would see is that the percent going to salaries over the years has become smaller and smaller, the larger share going into benefits. Uh, so looking ahead, we have a couple of things that could affect us for this next year. For the best practices incentive, we have to meet seven out of the eight criteria. And the first is to act as a policyholder for our health care services benefits. We've done that. Uh, we need to competitively bid at least one non-instructional service in 1213. We can do that. We can need to participate in schools of choice under Section 105 and 105C. We have done that for years. Uh, we need to measure student growth at least twice annually and report that to parents or provide MDE with a plan and show progress toward developing the technology infrastructure necessary to do this by 14-15. Uh, we don't currently do that, at least as best I can tell, but if we have to, I'm sure we can come up with a plan so that we can qualify for this money. Uh, we also need to provide dual enrollment and other opportunities for post-secondary coursework. We've done that for years. Provide online learning opportunities. We've done that for years. Provide a dashboard to parents in the community. That's already on our website. And then the other one that I'm not certain about, and that's to provide phys physical education and health classes that meet State Board of Education standards. And we're going to have to dig into this a little bit to see. We believe that our curriculum meets state standards, but we don't know if there's been sort of a super set of standards developed to try to push districts into more and more PE, for example. Uh, so the two that we wouldn't be certain about would be the twice a yearly monitoring of all students or assessing of all students, and then the, the PE. But certainly, we believe that we can meet the requirement on the monitoring and developing the plan for the technology. Uh, the PE remains to be seen. If it's a requirement to have daily PE for every student K through 12, we clearly are not going to be able to meet that standard. Uh, and there might be a distinction there between what the Michigan Department of Ed requires for PE curriculum now versus what the state board, because they came out with a statement mm -hmm. just a few weeks ago or a couple of months ago mm -hmm. that really did raise the bar. Mm -hmm. it, and I remember when I read that, the problem is that in a lot of school districts, in order to meet that, it means kids will not get something else somewhere else in the curriculum. And so they're forcing us to come mm -hmm. to grips with the health of our, our students yeah. by putting some money that incentivizes us to do so. The other big unknown is what will happen with House Bill 1040 and that would amend the retirement system, and it would make changes to pension and retiree health care benefits. There have been about three versions of this that have uh, been floated in the last month and a half, and progress on this seems to have stalled. Originally, uh, the first bill, I think, would have taken effect on July 1. Well, at this stage, it's a little too late for that. But any changes there could affect our contribution rate. That's certainly one of the intents is to drive that rate down. Uh, could, uh, if it did that, it probably would change that MIPSERS offset, the revenue categorical that we have for $912,000. And then the third effect could be to encourage some people to retire who might not have retired quite as soon, and that could then drive expenditures down. So there's, there's a lot of what ifs tied to that. And because it's such a large component of our budget, this will have a significant effect going forward, not only for this current year, but also for what 1314 might look like. Yep. And for fellow board members, I don't know if this is a good number or not, but it does not surprise me at all when you look at this rate of funding they've been doing. 
I read uh, this week in some news article that with decent return assumptions, meaning not seven and eight percent, but more like four and five percent, um, the state health and retirement fund is underfunded by seventy-two billion dollars. Never seen that figure. I only saw anything as high as forty-two billion. And, and I, I think it gets into how you look at future return assumptions and and to be a hundred percent funded. But still, it's in this fifty billion dollar or bigger number range. I would say up until last week, uh, I think Linda and I both agreed that we didn't think anything would happen with this. Uh, certainly, until maybe the legislature comes back in the fall. On uh, Gonwers and through the Mirrors organizations, which is the news outlets out on you know governmentally out of Lansing, the governor is not letting the legislature off the hook, and he and uh, John Nixon, I think is his name, uh, the state budget director, would like to see some deliberate study of it, even yet this week, so they could pass something this week. So, wow. Um, if they pass something on that kind of short notice, I would worry. I'd, I'd I'd feel more comfortable if they waited until at least midsummer in the fall. But uh, the governor's not letting anybody off the hook on this. Linda, well, bond ahead. agencies are starting to figure it out and understand you got these huge future liabilities and it's raising the interest rates on borrowing. That, that kind of liability, yeah. Are, are we on par with the MISPERS offset for this year? We're not being treated di differently than other districts? No, because it's based, <coughs> uh, it's purely percent of payroll. <coughs> And so okay. there, there's no uh, saying some districts have a higher foundation. It's not foundation-based at all. Uh, districts that have done a significant amount of privatizing receive fewer dollars because they've reduced their payroll. Privatization costs are a purchase service. They're not a salary-related mm -hmm. okay. cost. It's less payroll. Okay. Uh, we've done some privatization over the years, but not to the extent that some have. Now, many charter schools, for example, all of their teaching staff is privatized as well or a contracted service, so they qualify for nothing that, here. That's lovely. Charter <laughs> schools don't have that expense. So. No. Uh, uh, one item that I probably should have put here but didn't is what may happen to personal property tax reform. That has been a priority, but it seems to have slowed down. There are numerous proposals there. Depending on the nature of what is and is not included and how much replacement revenue there is and how it's distributed, it may or may not affect us. Uh, our basic operational millage, I wouldn't expect to see any change because the way the State Aid Act is written, that should just be a made up through state aid. Bigger concern would be the enhancement millage. But that it could be written in to be protected as well. Most recently, uh, most of the language seems to have protected school districts pretty well. Of course, the big unknown would be is there enough money in the system to actually do that, or would the foundation have to be reduced in order to right. make it up to everybody? But that, that would be the other unknown. But right now, I'd say it's too nebulous to even raise as a significant issue for. Yeah, the worst case I fear on that is municipalities and counties, et cetera, are going to get hit significantly. Mm -hmm. And if the state tries to make up some of that revenue from a state basis, that's less money for the school aid fund, and then they yeah. chop you. And in all likelihood, effects. I wouldn't expect it to affect the 12-13 budget. I think that would be a 13-14 issue. Okay. But it does have implications for revenue countywide on the enhancement, the enhancement and other programs. Yep. I mean, it's likely to be... At one point, uh, the ESA told us it could be as much as 1.7 million. Wow. Um, so I think it'll be over a million. Linda and I thought it was going to be closer to 1.2. So there's some significant revenue, which is just one more. I mean, as the, as we look at fund equity and what happens to it in the next three years, you know what? It gets a little scary to start talking about a 4% increase in retirement and losing a million from the ESA there. So yep. we're not out of the woods yet. Far from it. And that's the formal presentation. I probably should have put questions at the beginning. <laughs> and good about asking as we go along, which is yeah. nice. We don't have that's to. Any, can I just mention this, Jerry? Just. I mean, Linda does an incredibly good job. And um, uh, in recent years, under all kinds of pressure and a timeline that is very short to get ready for this meeting, 
And so when we talk to all of you, you know, about how busy her time and how obligated she is leading up to preparing for this, she's here during the day and the evenings, we're working on the weekends, others are too, but this is her time of year where, where she's primarily the one doing that. I would offer the packet that was included in your board packet as probably another great resource for you, especially new board members. I mean, take the time to read it. She puts a good narrative together. It's historically what we use. And it's much, much easier to understand our budget if you read this. Um, so it's a great resource, and she does a superb job of it. Thank I assume you. there's easy links on the website for the public? I don't know about that. Uh, we typically don't put the budget up. I don't know if it's part of the agenda. We don't put the budget up until after it's been adopted. After and then it goes adopted. on to the transparency website. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say thank you. I appreciate the, the comments, but I have some excellent help, too. Uh, Carol Laux, our business manager, she works behind the scenes. The two of us work together. We're always calling each other, saying, I need to get into the spreadsheet, or you need to do this. Uh, and I, I really count on her assistance as well as everyone else who contributes their share of the budget because each person is responsible for budgeting their area and then they funnel it through me. I do all of the personal budgeting for all of the teaching staff, the administrators, and the managers, but someone else handles budgeting for the paraprofessionals, office professionals. And since salaries are the largest part of our budget, it's, it's the people portion that's probably most significant. But I, I get a lot of good help from a lot of people at this time of year. Well, the level of granularity here is, is higher or better than I've seen in any other that's organization. Right. The granularity of getting down into the weeds on every little detail yes. is really outstanding. It's a lot of work, and yes. thank you. It's outstanding. I, I'm thinking between putting the contract to bed and get the budget to bed here, I think people need a vacation is what I'm thinking. I, so. I think that's <laughs> a really good idea. Rick. <laughs> Any other questions for Linda? Just, just let me just, I'm trying to frame this in my head here, I guess. So with all of our best efforts, and obviously the contract was a significant contribution to some improvements here on the expense side of the ledger, um, we are still dealing with what will be officially a budget that shows a deficit of roughly $7 million. Best guess, based on historical expenditure, we're down to $4 million. So we're expecting three weeks from now that we will end up taking roughly $3 million, $2.9 million out of fund balance. All right, this year, mm -hmm. this budget would say, best guess, $4 million out of fund balance. That's after significant work on the contract side of things. There are no significant, if any, program reductions built into this. There's no building closures built into this. So we just got to project ahead where will that come from next year so that we don't continue a $4 million real deficit going forward. Exactly. Exactly. That just kind of frames it. So, And 1314 does have one building closure. One building closure. That's exactly yeah. right. And then hope that there's some changes in a positive way on retirement side or who knows about enrollment. But at least we can level out. That would be a positive kind of thing. So it just... And you know, Rick, why well, I would say um, I think all of us are pleased that we've been able to push the, this teacher contract behind us. You can't look at those budget numbers and say uh, the next time around when it comes to negotiating the next contract. I mean, we and I think you as a board have known yeah. that in order to address our largest expense item from our largest employee group, mm -hmm. um, we could not solve the district's yeah. financial challenge in the settlement of one contract. That's right. Um, it, it's going to take two in order to get that done. And I only mention that because there is a sense of relief, I think, in the community. I've had community members tell me that. But people have to realize that it's not like we had reached the bottom and it's only going to mm -hmm. get better from here right. on up. If we aren't careful and something doesn't That's change, right. it'll be even worse than what the last two years have been. No, it is. And we have to prepare ourselves, and you have to prepare yourselves right. for that as board members. I, because here's the, here's the three hopes, and I said before, hope is not a strategy, is we're <laughs> hope that retirement will level off or improve our situation. We're hope that enrollment declines will level off or improve. And our hope is that foundation allowance will stop going down and might turn up. Those three things need to happen in a positive way for us to, to get to natural. <laughs> worry about something really severe. Yep. And that, to put it in, in perspective, I didn't point it out on your slide, um, doing a mental math and the memory of math, busing and athletics, and athletics doesn't even hardly get to a million dollars. Doesn't. 
So when you when you think about the what's left, or I'm sorry, the, the interstate transportation at 700 and something. Uh, no, uh, that was just oh, school buses. Right. Yeah, that, that was just, just buses. Just I'm sorry. I think you're that right. That was right. some million, wasn't it? Total transportation. The point is, there's not much else left. Not much left Thank to go you. anywhere. There we go. Yeah. Uh, Four percent of the entire budget is transportation. Three point two. Much of that special, some of that special ed. Exactly. Yeah. Which you're going to be required. Well, the point is savings in the worst case. Two and change the athletics doesn't get you out of this thing. That's right. Even if you made them all disappear. And we knew that, and we just had to put that in perspective. Well done, Linda. Really, thank you. Great thank job you. presenting it to us. Great job. Any other questions or comments for Linda? If not, we'll move on to agenda item 4.4, which is public hearing on said bud on the, on the budget. Um, I guess I don't have to call a vote to open the public hearing. No. At this point, we'll open the public hearing. And uh, looking at the attendance of the meeting, Some experts in the room. I wonder if there's any any of our attendees who are they, experts they, with great historical perspective they, of being former board members and being involved in this for years would like to comment at the public hearing on the budget. I don't want to embarrass them, but they've seen three times more budgets than I have. Than yes. I <laughs> Collectively. Your, your comments would be uh, well appreciated if you have any. <laughs> Seeing none. Any other takers? No other takers. We will then close the public meeting for the budget for next year. Just a clarification. Well, do we have another public hearing next time before or not just the one we time? We don't. Linda and I talked about this. Just, just now someone can still come the public under audience to visitors yep, yep. and we share invite their comments with the board. Yep. Typically, you wouldn't yep. do it at the meeting that where your back vote. is against yep. the wall and you have to yeah, uh, adopt a budget. And I hope people are watching and see that budget and are willing to come comment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. OK, we'll move on to the next uh, agenda item 5.1, Administrative Services Study Committee meetings. Lynn. Angela's oh, Angela's going to do, do it tonight. It tonight. We met um, last Wednesday, and we um, first thing we did was consider a grievance appeal at the step three level, and then we also reviewed the 3,000 professional staff policies, um, 3362 page six through 3531, and the 4,000 support staff, 4110 through 4162. The sections will present it be presented to the full board for adoption at an upcoming Board of Ed meeting. And our next meeting is this Wednesday, starting at 2 p.m. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Angela? Seeing none, we'll move on to Dr. Allison for 6.1 and 6.2. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I have three textbooks that I'd like to uh, bring, actually four textbooks, German textbooks and the Spanish textbook that will be available for that famous 28-day period of evaluation. The books are available if someone would like to look at them. They actually are books that uh, we are using in some different classes, but we need to change the courses that we want to use them for. Also this evening, I'd like to bring to you the annual event of bringing this, the uh, district school improvement plans. Uh, the buildings each create a plan through a rather lengthy process. And they have come together through months of work and hours of work. Um, and we might have a comment here from Mr. Kaminsky, who sits on the District School Improvement Committee. That is the uh, mechanism by which the district plan gets put together. And also, we review the building plans. And after that process, they go back to the buildings for final editing. That has happened. And those plans are now before you to be um, pulled together and then approved. And then they will go off and be uploaded to the state where they go on record. And the buildings actually use the plans and follow them through the next year. Um, as you come on to the district uh, school improvement committee, each of you will get that opportunity to really see in depth how that happens. So those will be available as well if anyone would like to take a look at them. And we'll act on those at the next board meeting. Any comments? Yeah, can I just <coughs> add to the, the school improvement process when we go through that? We touch on everything from uh, changes to MEEP scores in the future. We look at uh, the historical trends and achievement data. We look at each individual building. We look at the, uh, there's just a wide range of issues. We look at the individual subjects within the building and so forth. So, I mean, is there anything that, I mean, there's there's quite a bit of, uh, of uh, range of the topics going through. I mean, it's pretty much a building review and um, all the different, um, you know, aspects of, of operation. I thought there's a lot of opportunities to contribute. There's a lot of changes, a lot of state requirements are changing. So, you know, I thought, I thought, I don't know whether it's more exciting than going through the, the, the 
what the lost two volumes <laughs> of Los Angeles phone book of you know the administrative rules or whatever but um, okay. I mean it was actually pretty interesting and mm -hmm. you know we appreciate our public that comes out our teachers that are involved in the process administrators uh, and it's a real chance for the public to have input on the process and you know things change and that's that's one way to keep your, your eye on the ball and finger on the pulse of the district mm -hmm. actually we have about 30 people on the committee and uh, 15 of them are uh, parents and community members non affiliated with the school which was the design of the board uh, chartered that committee to be 50 50 and that makes for some very interesting conversations we actually look at demographic data academic data and perceptual data as well as we look to our needs and then build the plans for improvement and I just want to add that um, Kathy's pretty modest when it comes to uh, leading and facilitating um, this group because uh, the school improvement planning process and the plans that the state requires now are so detailed in so many different areas that um, it takes someone who is a master at understanding curriculum and instruction to really just hold those meetings. She has at least three, if not four of them, uh, throughout the year and reaches out to the community. There are even students. Uh, we have a high school student from both high schools that serve on that. And just to listen to those students, I remember, I think, uh, maybe last year, not this year, <laughs> One of the students had shared with me that she had no idea that what students do and how they plan for the activities instructionally with kids in the classroom, that it was so scientific. <laughs> you know, we don't often hear that word. You, you know, what we talked about best practices and being research-based, but to her it appeared that it was scientific. And you know what? It is. I mean, there are things you, that we do with children when it comes to their learning that, that research would tell you, if you do this, you're going to be effective. And uh, it's a pretty incredible process, and Kathy does a really great job of doing that and has, I think, for a long time, maybe longer than she wants me to even um, stay here. I can uh, personally uh, attest to that, is that's how I first got involved in Middle Povey Schools and with that's Kathy. True. And uh, I would encourage anybody in the community that has an interest in doing that, if you want to see the, the, um, the sausage of the results in a variety of areas in each of our buildings, it's a good way of getting involved to understand what's happening result-wise in the district and what actions have to happen then to make those results yeah. imp improve. So I'm just doing a call out to everyone uh, out there that if yeah. you want to get involved in our things beyond just your building, yeah. this is an excellent mechanism. Contact Kathy for interest and mm -hmm. go from there. And this is not a committee you join if you don't want to work. You got to work. <laughs> Kathy is good. You know, some people will join committees and all of a sudden when you're handed a copy of a building school improvement plan, and you have to put your handwriting on it to give them feedback, you take it seriously. She's even got the superintendent doing yep. that, which is not <laughs> easy to do. And some people will bail when they realize that's what they have to do. And she has that group well prepared for the last meeting in the spring that was just a couple weeks ago. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's good feedback for the buildings to get. Mm -hmm. So kudos. Actually, and after the uh, plans are approved, they will be on each school's website as well as ours will be. So. If people are just interested in even looking at them and reading about what we see, they are different than in the past because it's gone more electronic. We deal a lot more now with gap analysis and with causes and then building those strategies. But one of the most interesting pieces is that uh, it would be the goal of the state that everything you want to do would be in your plan. So <clears throat> just this week, Mr. Berlindi and I were talking about the homeless um, McKinney-Vento legislation. And lo and behold, as we're working our way through this multi-page document, we come to a place that says, is everything you intend to do for the homeless interventions in your district improvement plan? The answer was no, so I'm working on putting that in. So even as it is being reviewed, they are meant to be living documents. And things change, and you have to constantly monitor and adjust. So it's, a, it's really great. Yeah, great you. work by all of the... People don't realize how much work goes into it at the building, and you know those folks are trying to have kids every day and teach and learn. Exactly. Thank you, Kathy. Any other questions for Kathy? Thanks for all the effort in that. Okay, we'll move on to finance, and Linda gets to come again for 7-1 and 7-2. And I think we're going to be able to end the formal part of the meeting on a high note. Uh, we have two gifts for acknowledgement. The first is from the Midland Kiwanis Foundation, and it covered transportation costs for an East Lawn field trip to Science Under Sale. And then the other was from the National Energy Foundation, and it was support for the Think Energy Program with Consumers Energy, and it was a mini-grant program 
for Adams Elementary fourth grade teachers. And in order to qualify for this, they had to get their students involved in some energy conservation initiatives, and they were able to do that. So between the two, we have gifts totaling $462. Uh, the National Energy Foundation gift for Adams will be deferred for the 12-13 year because obviously it's too late to spend that money on the students this year. Uh, the one item that does require your action is a perfect example of what makes Midland such a unique community. We were contacted, this was not solicited, by Mary Coulter, and as you may see in the agenda, Mary and Fred were longtime residents of Midland, and their two, two children both graduated from H.H. Dow High School. It's important to Mary, as it was to her late husband, Fred, that all children have the opportunity for an advanced education. So Mary and her family have decided they'd like to assist a student in need, providing them an opportunity to attend college or a trade school. So funds totaling $10,000 have been contributed by the Mary and Fred Coulter Family Foundation to establish the Mary and Fred Coulter Family Scholarship, and they'll be distributed as outlined in the guidelines that were provided to you. And because Mrs. Coulter specifically asked that this that need be the primary driver behind the scholarship, she said that to protect the privacy of the student, she really didn't want a public announcement of that student's award. Uh, but our buildings have gone, or our Dow High has gone ahead and identified a student, and we do have someone who's going to be the beneficiary of this scholarship should you approve it. So of course, we recommend that you establish the Mary and Fred Coulter Family Scholarship as part of our trust fund that's administered by Chemical Bank. We'll entertain a motion. I'll move. Support. Moved by Mr. Oley and supported by Ms. Baker. Um, any questions or comments on the Coulter Family Scholarship? Very generous. Again, very generous. Very nice. Okay, all in favor of accepting, say aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much to Mary Coulter. Nice to us. Um, the rest of the meeting, uh, we have correspondence to and from the Board of Education listed in the agenda, in addition to the uh, schedule of upcoming meetings through the summer and through the fall of next year. And that takes us into study discussion session. And with that, I'll start to my immediate left with Mr. Oley. Um, most importantly, congratulations to all of our graduates and all of our staff that contributed towards the gra graduation. Of all of our seniors, um, and congratulations to uh, Ms. Baker and Mr. Mall for their children graduating. And I, I, I suspect, I don't know if this could be fact, but Lynn probably set the all time record for the most kids graduating in MPS by a board member. I, I, don't, know. <laughs> I don't know who would rival you, kind of thing. But uh, anyway, so, so congratulations. It's really, as it always is, a wonderful event. And staff do a great job with the graduation. I um, also want to congratulate all the various teams and individuals who um, received um, honors for completing the um, spring sports season whether it be um, girls soccer like Dow High and baseball and golf and um, track and field and what have you. And I know we had some um, awards for coaches. I know Eric Albright got the coach of the year for baseball, and I'm sure I'm probably missing a couple as well. But congratulations to all of them as that is all winding down right now. I um, want to thank Linda one more time for um, doing a wonderful job. And I know you have a large team that contributes towards it, but it's still it's your leadership that puts a very complicated subject together in a way that, that all of us can understand. And thanks again to Dr. Ellison for your leadership on an ongoing basis, which you're probably right, we probably take for granted, but it's just as important as anything, and probably more important than other things that we do. And it's your leadership that makes it happen, Kathy. So thank you for that as well. And I think um, that's it, other than the obvious um, thanks again to the Mary and Craig Coulter family. So generosity beyond anything we can probably describe rather than say very sincere thank you so that's all I got um, also thanks to the Coulter family for making a, a higher education a possibility for somebody in need that's a very uh, very generous gift uh, just with going through the budget presentation thanks Linda you and your team I don't know how many hours uh, weekends evenings that you put into uh, uh, getting this ready it's our first firm look at what the budget's going to look at for 12-13. We realize that's going to change. We realize that there's limits to how much you can predict the future. Uh, but hopefully as time goes on, we can build some unity in the district as far as our budgets, numbers, and projections, and where fund equity is going and so forth. Um, and just thanks to all the employee groups for the contributions to making this, uh, at least on the expense side, a, a better picture uh, going forward. Um, your uh, contributions are very uh, much appreciated. Um, Pass on to 
Am I right? Alrighty. Well, graduation was wonderful this year, and it was um, a little bittersweet for me as well. It, it kind of brings to a close 26 years as an MPS parent, so um, I guess I'll be taking another, moving into a, a different realm next year as um, we'll still be actively involved with the schools. And I said, maybe it's a good thing I'm still on the board for a couple of years. I just won't go so cold turkey into um, not, not being involved with the schools, but. Um, Grandkids on the way, though. Yeah, <laughs> they're in a different oh. district, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll cheer them. Hey, have move them back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just had that you got a basement? Tonight. I know. <laughs> well, and as we talk about college and um, you know, the, the two newspapers, I always enjoy these, and the senior issues, the variety of plans our students have and the places they're going to go, whether it's um, yeah, four-year university, community colleges, the military, and uh, I think those of us that are getting ready to pay some t college tuition bills um, can really appreciate what the Coulter family has done here for, s for students. College and post-secondary costs have just skyrocketed like everything else. I, ooh, get one more to go through college, and uh, you know, it's, it's quite different in the last 14 years. I thought it was expensive back in 98. Did you, Rick? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot more expensive now, but um, we know how important it is, and, and our kids are very well prepared. Um, as Rick said, you look at, at a lot of the accomplishments they make in, in athletics, but also the many, many awards and scholarships our, our students receive, yeah. and um, it's it's pretty amazing. So that that is, brings about thanks to teachers and our administrators and everybody that's involved, parents that that uh, volunteers that touch our students' lives because they wouldn't have these opportunities without without everybody working together. And I guess thanks also to Linda and Kathy and oh, since Gary's sitting over there too. <laughs> yeah, you were here last week. Yeah, to the contact's old news. <laughs> <laughs> because boy, they help us make us look good and you do deserve a great summer. So hopefully your work doesn't stop, but hopefully you get a little downtime and as well as teachers and parents and kids, summer, summer is a great time to do some other things and, um, and get ready. Next year, fall will be here before we know it. So yep. on that note, I'll pass it on. Well, I just wanna say I really enjoyed graduation. This was the first time I, um, was part of that, but it was just so exciting to me to be able to look at those kids and say, congratulations, so-and-so, and it was just really exciting. I really enjoyed that a lot, so I'm looking forward to doing that again. And I also want to thank Linda Klein for all her hard work, and um, the thing I noticed, too, that she does so well is explain it to me in a way I can understand. I noticed <laughs> that the first time I came in her office and talked to her, I was just amazed. I thought, wow, this all makes sense to me. So I'm really grateful. And to Mr. Verlindi, too, I thought about this, all his hard work, all these months, and now tonight he's not really an actor. More player. relaxed, I'm yeah. Yeah. A little relaxed. bit more relaxed. But I thought about I, that. I think he's happy. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he must be very happy, but I thought about that as we went along. He put in a lot of time, and I'm sure there was just an awful lot of frustration with that. And So I really appreciate all your hard work there, too. And um, let's see, I just want to... Hey, congratulations to Lynn on all your children graduating, and it must be a great feeling. And yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but I wanted to follow up on something you said, too, about how our kids are just so well prepared for everything, and uh, teachers here just really encourage kids to think they can do anything, and I think that's great. I'm really grateful for that as a parent of kids in this district, because they, they believe they can, and I think that's great. All right, well. Well, not quite last, but almost. <laughs> I, I, like Yvonne, attended my first graduation as a board member, and it was just wonderful. I really enjoyed it. I was so impressed with the speeches that were given. And um, following up on Mary and Fred Coulter, Pam Castle made a point during her speech of saying how much money the kids had been offered in scholarships, and it was unbelievable to me. Just really speaks highly of how much hard work these kids put in and how much support there is in the community for that. So, And on the School Improvement Committee, I was on that committee last year, and I don't think a lot of people understand. It was quite an eye-opener for me of what the state requires 
and how much time and effort is put in behind the scenes that probably no one would realize unless they had been on that committee. And, and I, someone else had said that, how much time people must put in when you think of what they really need to do from you know a school level of being there for the kids and how much time they must have to put into this very tedious document. So thanks for working on that because I have a feeling most people don't even understand <laughs> how detailed that is. So and that would be all. And we're off to high school at our house next year. Yay. All right. Cool. Cool. <laughs> Excited. We already have our Dow charger sign in our window. Very so good. We are set. Start saving for your car insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I just have two things. Um, I've gone through eight, nine, nine graduations now. And while they're very similar, they're all unique. And what's unique is each kid. And it's really fascinating to see how much the kids really care. You know, they put on an air of, yeah, yeah, yeah. But each one comes up with a big smile on their face, nervous clammy hand and and, uh, and, and, and and you know they really are, are are into it and I just uh, that's a testament to our parents our staff that our kids care that much about what they've accomplished in their in their time with us that, that it's always very touching to me the other thing is um, I hear them every year uh, Jan Goodell used to do it at Dow High um, uh, I'm sure it happens at Midland High and uh, where she lists the accomplishments of the senior class. And some of you pointed out the scholarship money, et cetera. Um, you know, hate to sound to say it sounds like a broken record, but for nine years, it's this big list of really great accomplishments, national merit scholars, you know, on and on and on. Um, this is the first time, though, after graduation, uh, either that night or succeeding nights at open houses and things I've gone to, where I've had parents come up to me that were amazed at what our kids were accomplishing, that they had no idea. They've never been through a graduation before. When they heard that list, were just absolutely amazed at, at what, what was accomplished and how good our schools were, uh, that they could accomplish that while they were here. And so it was really gratifying as a board member to have people unsolicited come up and comment about what a wonderful district we have, that those kids could accomplish that, and, and the staff and stuff to do that. So that, that really felt good in all these issues we're dealing like with tonight. Uh, lastly, uh, I think Linda touched on it during the budget presentation. Unfortunately, and I say this unfortunately, uh, because of the full day kindergarten program now offered by us at all of our elementary buildings, our kindergarten complement program has been, by definition, eliminated. And that's a little sad because it was an excellent program. And we want to take a moment to thank the kindergarten complement leads and assistants who did a wonderful job over the past years as they worked with our youngest students coming in made a real difference and the high quality child care program provided a wonderful comprehensive program that then complemented the kindergarten that's what made it so unique and, and so good and uh, the students they served through the years have truly benefited from all those people's dedication and making that work and want to send our best to those people that were involved in it as they go forward and uh, they've truly served our children and thereby our community in a very, very good basis. So thank you, and I hope uh, things go well for you in the future. Carl. Uh, just a couple of announcements here and there, fairly brief this evening. Uh, I just would like the board and the community to know that Midland High uh, seniors had five Saginaw Valley League most valuable play, uh, player award winners, and 102 Saginaw Valley All Academic Certificates. Wow. Pretty incredible. Wow. Not just do we have athletes, not just do we have scholars here, but we have student athletes that are scholars, and that's something we should all be proud of. 25% of the graduating seniors at Midland High graduated with a GPA of 3.8 or higher, a quarter of the, the, the kids there, so that's pretty incredible. Um, five National Merit semifinalists over at Dow High. Pretty incredible. Five commended scholar students along with the National Merit Scholarship Program or among the, the, the scholarship program. And congratulations to the MPSPE teacher, Diane Sugden, for receiving the 2012 Lloyd Osborne Award. This award is given to a person who best exhibits the qualities of service to youth, sports, and the community, as did the late uh, Lloyd Osborne. 
who was a teacher, coach, and athletic director at Northeast Middle School for a number of years. So congratulations to Diane. And just a brief shout out that's kind of a personal shout out. I did not know this until a staff member shared with me about a week ago, uh, last Friday actually, um, that Diane, even when she was not assigned a PE teaching position at Parkdale, used to come over there every morning before school, before she would teach and have those Parkdale kids either involved in some physical activity hmm. or jump rope um, uh, program mm -hmm. like they would do, which really speaks to what one of our staff members does without any accolades um, required. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of people that would do the same thing, but I just think given that her award this year, now is the time to mention that. Two last items, and talking about how much money our, our students really earn in scholarships. Um, Chemic seniors at Midland High, were offered over $6 million in scholarships and students accepted over $2 million. So if you take what they were offered, and many students were offered more than they could take advantage of, that kind of defines uh, this great scholarship offering that our students earn. And at Dow High, the seniors um, were offered scholarships that totaled over $7.2 million. And approximately 147 of the 318 students there received scholarship money. That represents 46% of the Dow High senior class. Those are pretty incredible statistics, and I say that it, this every year. You find me in another school district that has kids with that kind of financial support when they graduate, students, I shouldn't call them kids. That makes a very strong statement. My very last comment for the evening is, our staff and our kids, students, don't do this by themselves. There are seven board members here that set a standard of expectation for me, for all of us, for our staff here that we enjoy stepping up and delivering to. And so what I would say that I knew about this district before I joined it five years ago, and that is a long history of excellence. I mean, it's part of our tagline, but it really means something here to this community. The seven of you set the standard for all that. You believe in that so much, or you wouldn't be serving on the board. You too play a role in the success of all our students. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for the good of the order? Just just one comment, I guess, and we've touched on it in past meetings. There are um, probably quite a few, I don't know what the number is, of our students who graduated, and they've made the decision to join the military. And I just wanted to thank them for that. I wish we got to speak. Doodle. We stand adjourned with that.